all right so so today what we are going to do is to look at uh, the basics of what an architecture can look like a hardware architecture for solving a given problem right for us an example dsp problem right we'll take a very ba simple example come up with a very basic architecture for it and from there sort of see how we can modify it to make it incrementally sort of programmable and eventually sort of get the idea of how a general architecture is likely to look okay and uh, that will sort of give us a flavor of both how programmable architectures look as well as how we can build custom architectures for solving problems that are not limited to solving just one problem but might have some extensibility in some ways okay so the problem the example that we are going to look at is the so called fir filter right which is essentially defined by the equation y of n equals i'm going to take a very specific example of an fir filter a uh, very trivial example it has three coefficients a times x of n plus b times x of n minus 1 plus c times x of n minus 2 okay a b c are some constants some coefficients that have been defined based on some characteristics that we require the filter to have x of n is the input okay so therefore x of n minus 1 is one previous sample of the input x of n minus 2 is two samples previous etc right how the numbers are represented how many bits are used etc i'm going to ignore for now we'll get into that in probably the next one of the next two classes right number representations and so on we'll spend some time on but for the time being i'm just going to assume that we know how to represent these values uh, in some binary format and things like multiplication addition etc are known we know how to do those operations okay so if i asked you to just outright you know build a hardware architecture that implements this what are the things that you are likely to require and how would you go about building it? <coughs> a shift register right probably is the most sensible or the most obvious way to obtain x of n minus 1 and x of n minus 2 from x of n okay so what would that look like it would essentially say fine my x of n is coming in here right and this arrow over here essentially indicates it is some kind of a multi bit bus it could be a 16 bit bus something like that all that it means is all of those data are synchronized they are changing in sync with each other okay the shift register essentially says there will be some block which i'm going to just use a rectangle to represent and at the output of that block is going to be x of n minus 1 right the implicit assumption over here is that i have some kind of a signal which is basically the sample clock which is going to come to this register okay i'm not going to draw the clock from now onwards i'm just going to assume that whenever i draw a block a rectangle like this it's understood to be a shift register okay there is another shift register because i also need x of n minus 2 right of course it has the same clock otherwise it would not really make sense to use a register like that okay all right so far so good i have got x of n coming in from somewhere and from that i am deriving x of n minus 1 and x of n minus 2 what do i need to do with all of these values multiply by the corresponding coefficients okay all right so let's see how we'll do that i'm just going to draw it as a block that says a over here another block that says b and the third block that says c right so what i mean by this is that x over there indicates that it is a multiplier and the value next to it a b or c indicates the coefficient that's being used to multiply now i need to add all of these together rather than just pulling all of them into a single adder i'm going to assume further that my adders themselves are two input adders okay therefore one way of doing it is to have one adder over here and say i'll take this and this and add them together this and this and add these two together and as a result i get 
y of n out here okay so hopefully it is obvious to all of you by now that this is not a unique architecture right there are other ways in which i could have made these connections right so for example why did i choose to add the a and b multiplier outputs together first and then add them to the c multiplier output could it have been done by having one single three input adder right could i have changed the direction of some of these signals done it in a different order some other way of doing this all of that in other words there are multiple possibilities okay and this is just one example of course it is a reasonably obvious example obvious architecture that we can come up with so it's hard to really find fault with this okay so now what can we infer from this architecture once i have come up with this architecture the questions that i need to ask are essentially one question that i would want to ask is how fast can this process data okay and what determines that what would it be that determines the rate at which this architecture can process data assuming that somehow i can provide my input samples fast enough right remember we had this discussion earlier where we said that normal signal processing algorithms have this property that very often their sampling rates are set by some physical constraints some property such as for example there's no point in sampling voice at more than let's say you know 40 44 44, 44 kilohertz or something like that even music right because the human ear cannot really sense anything beyond that similarly for vision more than 60 frames per second is unnecessary because you really can't make out you know that level of detail in fact 30 frames per second is the limit of persistence of vision right so there are physical reasons why certain signal processing applications have a required sampling rate okay but in this case i'm going to leave all that out of the picture and say from my architecture side what limits my performance okay how fast can this run how fast can i sample and process data when i operate with something like this what would it be that is my limiting factor over here huh? the clock period okay so in other words as i have shown over here essentially the clock that i have over here this is both the clock period and that happens to be equal to the sample period right why am i saying that because my assumption is that by connecting the clock like this to the registers right i am essentially saying that every time there is a positive edge of the clock a clock tick one sample gets transferred from input to output okay so every time there is a clock tick there is a shift of one sample therefore the clock period and the sample period in this case are the same okay so then asking what is the highest rate at which this can sample is the same as asking what is the highest clock period or rather the highest clock frequency that can be used with this circuit and what determines that uh, clock frequency the critical path through this circuit right the critical path essentially being the longest set of combinational elements that is present in this circuit which effectively if you look at it comes down to this path over here okay because there is an implicit assumption that there is some kind of a register at the input side over here and also a register at the output side those i have not drawn but those are implicit okay so if i take those two into account this becomes the critical path right which determines the minimum time period or in other words the maximum frequency at which this system can operate okay and in this case supposing the delay through a multiplier let's call it tm it would probably be some you know either 1 nanosecond a fraction of a nanosecond or 2 nanosecond some number like that in units of time okay some number of nanoseconds hopefully but then there are also two adders right so tm plus 2 ta seems to be the critical path through this circuit okay so implicitly what i'm assuming over here is that i can associate one number right called the delay through the multiplier or the delay through the adder and say this is the propagation delay through an adder now in practice what you will actually find is the actual delay through an adder depends also on what inputs are actually given to it because if there is a pair of inputs that causes a long ripple through the carry chain the actual delay before the outputs settle down to their final values will be higher then if i am just adding let's say 0 plus 0 where nothing is changing 
right? Or even zero plus one, where maybe one bit changes at the output. Okay, so the TM and TA, in other words, are typically assumed to be the worst case delays through the units because ultimately critical path we are interested in worst case performance. So TM plus two TA is the critical path through this circuit. So what kinds of hardware elements are we using over here? We are essentially saying we have multi-bit shift registers right why am i saying multi-bit because all the bits corresponding to x of n have to be synchronized and loaded into that register at one time instant essentially okay the enable signal or whatever it is that i use in order to load data into the register has to be one synchronized thing across 16 bits so that all the 16 bits of x get stored at the same time instant. I have multipliers how many bits are these going to be that depends on my number representation we will look at all that later and I have adders <coughs> okay so as long as I have some way by which I can design adders multipliers and shift registers right uh, or registers and i can just connect them up i can get this hardware architecture built i can actually probably even put it together on a breadboard if necessary or i can do a, a custom layout and get a ic uh, chip designed out of this okay not very hard to do okay so so far so good what are the drawbacks with this architecture what problems can you think of with this architecture Is there a problem at all with this architecture or is everything perfect? This is the best possible architecture. Huh? Parallelism. Why is parallelism and what do you mean by that? I mean, just elaborate. The third adder has to wait for the first input and second input. Okay, so yeah, I mean you know uh, this is a good point essentially what you are saying is that this adder which is adding the output of the c multiplier with the others has to wait until the previous adder has completed yes uh, i wouldn't necessarily call that a drawback of this architecture because at the end of the day the moment you force yourself to use only two input adders it means that you have to use two adders and one has to operate after the other okay so yes that is definitely one issue with this architecture but not necessarily a drawback of the architecture per se okay but what i am looking at is something slightly different how would i change the filter that i wanted to implement let's say i wanted to change the coefficients how easy is that going to be is that trivial to do how would you do it change the ABC so that means where are the ABC present are they just the way that I have drawn it I have not indicated where the ABC are okay so that's part of the catch over here right I have just drawn them next to the multiplier so there are two ways that can happen one is I actually hard code it into the multiplier which literally means that only those partial products corresponding to the bits of A and those corresponding to the bits of B etc are even activated they only those even exist physically Right? That's like a high level of optimization, but if you write Verilog code, that's precisely what will happen. The compiler will actually optimize to that level. right? Because it knows that these are now constants that you are using. It will just optimize out everything that's unnecessary. <coughs> which means that changing A suddenly becomes very difficult. It means I have to recompile my entire design. And recompiling in hardware, unlike you know making a change in an editor and just uh, typing make, it's not that simple. It's a very complicated process. If you if it's on an FPGA, yeah, it's doable. If it's on an ASIC, it's essentially not going to happen because it means a complete new run through the fabrication system. Okay, so how do you store the values of A, B, and C is a question that you need to think about. Okay, now what does that in turn uh, translate into? If I have the values of A, B, and C hard coded into the multiplier, it simply means that I cannot change them. On the other hand, if I had something where, let's say, I 
have the same architecture but somehow I say that this is going to get its input from some other register. This is going to get its input from yet another register and this is going to get its input from a third register and I store the values of A, B and C over here. Okay. Now to some extent at least that can be changed. Right? I have made my architecture slightly more complicated and my multipliers are now no longer specialized. They are actually general multipliers that can multiply any coefficient with any input value. Okay, because I could change the values of A, B and C while the system is operational. Okay, then of course it raises the question of how am I actually going to load values into these registers, right? There can be some load enable, there are ways by which it can be done, but it also increases the complexity, but at the same time, you know, it's not very easy to do. Okay. So that's one part of it. At least if I want to change the coefficients, I could handle it that way. Right? What about the next question? What if I want to change the number of taps? Instead of having three coefficients, A, B and C, I want four, A, B, C, D. What would I need to do? I pretty much have to redo the design. I mean, I, it's easy to draw what it requ what is needed, but in terms of the hardware, I have to resynthesize. Okay, there's really nothing else that I can do over here. Okay, so that's yet another drawback. So if I try listing the drawbacks, one is <coughs> changing coefficients is not easy. Changing number of taps is requires recompilation essentially or resynthesis. And the other one is the clock and sample. These being tied together is not necessarily a good thing. It basically means that yes, I'm designing a system where even if my sample period that I require is only one microsecond or you know, few milliseconds, I basically have to create and you know, and my clock in principle could operate at let's say a few megahertz or even gigahertz. It doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned, I still need to just operate that system at a slower rate. Right? My registers that are capable of switching at hundreds of megahertz are going to be kept slowly switching at whatever rate that is actually required by this clock. Okay, So even the fact that my hardware may be capable of operating much faster than I need, I can't really make use of that. Okay, Is that necessarily a drawback? In some ways, yes, for the simple reason that maybe I could have come up with another architecture that did not need three multipliers, two adders in order to implement this operation. Okay. <coughs> So we are going to now look at a slightly modified version of this architecture and say, or rather a significantly modified version of this architecture and see, if I have only one multiplier and adder, how would I go about implementing this filter? Okay. And what I'm going to do is pretty much straight away draw what the final architecture could potentially look like. Okay. What I'm going to assume is that I have one multiplier. The output of that goes to one input of an adder. The output of that adder in turn goes to a register and the output of this register comes out of the system as well as has a feedback loop going in here. Okay, I'm going to just draw one green line over here and also one line over here. We'll get to why those are needed later, right? Those are essentially to sort of be able to reset and break that loop whenever we need it. Okay. But now with this architecture in place, this structure in place, what I'm going to say is now, how would you do your filtering? Okay. And one way that I can think about it is I have the inputs coming in from here. What I need is at some point in time x of n comes in, at the same time a comes in. 
next time instant x of n minus 1 comes in and b comes in here next time instant x of n minus 2 comes in here and c comes in here okay So the first time around x of n into a then next clock cycle x of n minus 1 into b next clock cycle x of n minus 1 into c what is happening here x of n into a comes out here goes through the adder as long as the register initially has a value of 0 0 plus a into x of n okay at t equal to 1 I will do that sum whatever was already there plus b into x of n minus 1 and at t equal to 2 I will do this sum plus c x of n minus Okay, and at this point I can basically say take this transfer to output right what should happen at t equal to 3 I should once again do 0 plus a into x of n plus 1 at t equal to 4 I will do that plus b x of n etc ok so in other words once in every 3 clock cycles I will get an output ok so my hardware architecture is now using one multiplier one adder one register right and some there is actually quite a bit of extra support circuitry over here that I have not shown what kind of support circuitry do I need <coughs> huh? I need some place some shift registers or something that are going to hold the x of n values that still remains I have not drawn it over here but that sort of implicit in this place right I also need some kind of memory that will store my coefficients I need some kind of a counter that will count 0 1 2 0 1 2 0 1 2 0 1 2 ok I need a multiplexer out here either feedback or 0 right which is essentially related to this so the two green things are essentially related to each other right either I just feed back a 0 <coughs> to the adder at the appropriate time that is whenever t is equal to 0 or 3 or 6 or something like that I feed back a 0 as one of the inputs to the adder automatically it will update the register correctly at the end of that clock cycle or I could reset the register explicitly ok but what it means is all of these things that I have marked in red are essentially now supporting circuitry that I have not even shown in the figure so there is some additional overhead right I have got rid of two multipliers and one adder yes but instead and of course the shift register was anyway required in the other case but I do have a counter I do have a multiplexer that is the very bare minimum additional circuitry that I need ok which one is better is this architecture better than the other one what would you say huh? it is more flexible right on the face of it one of the things is it looks like it is more flexible in what ways is it more flexible increasing the number of tabs now essentially becomes I could potentially do this without resynthesizing anything as long as I can change the counter 
instead of counting 0, 1, 2 and then going back to 0, if I can make it go 0, 1, 2, 3, I could potentially just make it do 4 taps or 6 taps or 10 taps. Okay. Of course, I will need to have a shift register that correspondingly expands. But shift registers can be implemented in different ways. right? It could be some kind of a separate memory that I look at, which is just designed for the worst case. What it means is that as long as I can provide the memory to store the intermediate values or the <coughs> past values, I do not really need to worry about how many taps I can implement. I could expand this any way that I like. Okay. So that is one thing that can be done if I use this architecture. Let's go one step further and sort of see if we can clean that up a bit more and basically look at exactly what it would look like. right? So by the way, this unit that I have drawn over here, what operation is it doing? This is a Mac, right? So the Mac that you probably have heard a lot about already and you will hear a lot more of in this course, the multiply accumulate, this is exactly it, okay? All right. Now, the way that I could do this would be, I take two memory blocks. Right? And over here, I start storing the values x of n, x of n minus 1, x of n minus 2. And over here, I store the values a, b, c, corresponding to the data locations 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2 respectively. So I can just use one external counter out here <coughs> and feed this as the address to each of these memory blocks. Okay, And along with that, I will have this multiplexer out here. that basically needs to check for whether counter is equal to 0. Okay, That's used in order to decide whether I have the feedback 0 coming in or something else happening over there. Okay, Now look at my architecture, it is starting to look more and more general. right? My values, the x of n values are now stored in a separate memory block. My coefficients are stored in a separate memory block. If I want to change the coefficients, I just have to change the values in some memory. right? And that memory is being read out one element at a time. So it is a regular SRAM type of block that I am talking about over here. Okay? What is the address going to that block? It is essentially something that is just a counter by changing the limit of the counter instead of going up to 0, 1, 2, if I change it to 3 or 4 or 5, I can change the number of taps in the filter. right? And in fact, I can probably actually say that you know the sequence of steps to be followed is something like this. Initialize by setting counter equal to 0 and I will take some variable, I will call it next and set it equal to 2. right? and then go into a while loop that says whenever the counter is equal to 0 what I need to do is reset the accumulator update the value in the memory mem1 of next with something that is coming from the input. right? So this is basically the x of n storage. <coughs> and next is equal to basically next minus 1. <coughs> 
modulo n right where n equal to 3 here okay what does that next minus 1 modulo n do we'll see that in a moment essentially why am i doing this i'm sort of trying to be a bit clever over here in terms of how i do the shift register okay we'll just look at that in a moment after this the next step would essentially be after all of that thing has been done multiply and add mem1 of counter with mem2 of counter and do counter equals counter plus 1 modulo n okay so what's happening out here this this set of steps out here is essentially trying to do it's trying to check once in every 3 clock cycles that is whenever the counter becomes equal to 0 there is some bookkeeping that needs to be done what is the bookkeeping reset the accumulator to 0 load the new input into some location in memory and that location in memory that i'm going to load it into change that for the next time around okay so if you look at how this works the counter i'm going to assume is base uh, or rather the counter the way that i've written it over here is counter will go 0 1 2 0 1 2 because modulo n right percentage n basically means when it reaches 3 Three percentage three will become zero. It's a modulo counter. Okay, this is essentially something called a circular buffer. Okay, so what we are doing over here is in hardware, it's very easy to implement a shift register. The moment we start thinking about memory blocks and software, shift registers are no longer very efficient because shift registers involve moving a large amount of data around. Right, every piece of data needs to move into an adjacent location even from the point of view of hardware that's actually a bad idea for the simple reason that it's probably going to end up consuming a lot of energy right why is that because toggling of inputs right let's say that i have a 100 tap filter there are 100 elements that need to get shifted right whole bunch of bits toggling whereas what i really need to do is keep 99 of them the same throw out the oldest one and replace it with the newest one that's what i'm doing here okay i store one new variable called next initialize it to 2 and every time the counter becomes zero that is once in every 3 clock cycles i take whatever i've got as input and store it into mem of next and decrement next so that next time it becomes 1 okay actually no my mistake i should have done that the other way no it should be plus 1 you know i i think i need to make two minor modifications here this should be plus 1 and it could actually be initialized to zero itself okay so what will happen is the first time around x of 0 that's coming in will go into location number 0 in mem1 okay the next time after that x of 1 will go into location number 1 then it will go into uh, x of 2 will go into location number 2 etc right and so we'll have a circular buffer being built up over there when the next value comes it will overwrite the oldest one it will overwrite x of 0 and i'll get the uh, next time it will overwrite x of 1 then overwrite x of 2 etc okay so always by doing this kind of a circular increment i'm guaranteeing that the oldest value that was stored in that buffer is the one that's going to get overwritten okay now what was the point of this exercise why did i write out this something that looks like software the basic idea is to show you that the level at which i have written this software is literally controlling each and every register and every hardware element okay this is what is sometimes called <coughs> rtl code register transfer level right i am working at the level of registers and literally telling you at every clock cycle at every step how is that how are those registers getting updated okay that level of detail if i can provide it's register transfer level code which is very easy for a hardware compiler to convert into actual hardware 
how will it convert it into hardware over here it's very clearly defined right counter is a register next is a register accumulator is a register mem1 mem2 are memory blocks a while loop is well doesn't even require any implementation in hardware how does a if condition get implemented in hardware it's a multiplexer okay so if select is equal to 0 something happens if select is equal to 1 something else happens okay that's precisely what a multiplexer does okay so each and every step that i've written over here is something that's easy to implement in terms of hardware okay so we now already have the basics of what a generic architecture for solving something like the fir filter problem could look like okay where do we go from here any questions so what we can do with something like this is if i want to generalize the idea what i'll say is what was it that i actually had over here i had something that this was compute this was memory and this along with the wires etc that it involved is what control okay so in other words i can think of any architecture or any problem that i want to solve in terms of something that i will call a data path which has the ability to do computations and a controller right where the controller in addition to just having just sending out you know having counters and so on can send any kind of signals it will be load signals it will be start signals it will look for ready or done signals from the data path and then decide what to do next all the complexity the decision making is hidden away inside the controller and the data path just does simple arithmetic okay usually this is then combined along with a few other things in particular there is something called a register file but you could also have memory blocks right and the output of the data path could be routed to any of those depending on what the control says right the control could also determine how the register file is activated so that you can write, write values into it the outputs of this in turn could come through some kind of a large multiplexer and go into the data path okay once i have got to this level depending on what i put into the controller for all practical purposes i have got a programmable system okay my data path has to be able to respond i give it two inputs or you know one input or two inputs or three inputs whatever and i give it the corresponding control signals it does something chugs away a little bit and gives me an output okay the controller can then take care of deciding what those inputs are where are they coming from are they coming from registers are they coming from memory are they coming from the outside world right where are they going are they going back to registers are they going back to memory are they going to a d to a converter are they going to a display anything of that sort okay so the controller essentially separates out the what is happening with how it is done okay in general when we are talking about hardware architectures these are important concepts to keep in mind because all the hardware designs that we will be looking at we will primarily be using a tool called high level synthesis for the rest of our design process right 
all of it will involve this kind of structure. There will be some elements of the code that you write which will get inferred as the data path, the computational elements. And the rest of it is basically a question of figuring out the control logic around it. Okay, and providing the right signals to the controller. Okay. All right, we'll stop here for today. And uh, there's a quiz. So we'll get to that quiz in a moment. Let me just...